podcast. So um, I'm getting ready. I just started to record. So welcome to the March National Heritage Area Best Practices Call. My name is Heather Wickens, um, one of the three people that coordinate the National Heritage Area Best Practice Calls, along with Sarah Lyle and Katie Durkin. So um, welcome. Today's topic, we're going to be talking about um, really rec recreational opportunities, rental programs with bikes and boats that national heritage areas offer. And so the four national heritage areas we'll be featuring in today's call are the Augusta Canal National Heritage Area, the Illinois and Michigan Canal National Heritage Area, Schuylkill River Greenway National Heritage Area, and Susquehanna National Heritage Area. And just some housekeeping, we will take questions at the end of um, after all four presenters have shared. Um, and so if you have a question, you can type it in the chat or you can hold it um, and we will get to it when we open it up for questions. So without any further ado, our first presenter is Dayton Treehouse and he will be sharing about Augusta Canal National Heritage Area. And I'm getting ready to share it. Dayton, hold on just a second. Okay. Okay, you can go to the second slide, uh, Heather, and I'll stay there for a few minutes. Okay, um, Augusta Canal uh, dates back uh, when it was built was in 1845, and it was greatly enlarged by 1875. Uh, the canal system was patterned after the one in Lowell, Massachusetts, and Augusta advertised itself as the Lowell of the South for 50 years until right after the 1900s and decided to, to rename itself the Garden City. And it remains that way today. But you see the canal there and uh, it's very different than a lot of the transportation canals you might have seen in the Northeast. Uh, this was primarily built for, for the purposes of, of uh, hydromechanical power uh, to attract uh, the textile industry to the South. Um, uh, the South was known at that time as King Cotton, basically an agricultural economy. And uh, some of our leaders said it made no sense for Augusta to produce uh, the raw product, that is cotton, send it to the Northeast and have them convert it into cloth. And then we turn around and buy it back. What we needed to do was to, to uh, utilize uh, uh, the water off the Savannah River by building a canal system, much like Lowell, Massachusetts did. And um, so this is one of the mills, uh, Sibley Mill, uh, that was uh, built uh, in uh, uh, 18, uh, uh, the canal was finished in 1846. And uh, this, was, uh, this one was in 1850s. Uh, uh, um, and it, it was the site of the Confederate States Powder Works. That big chimney is the only thing that's left standing from where the Powder Works was held, uh, uh, built during the Civil War. Uh, this, this mill and the other one you see in the background, plus another one that you can't see, all have hydroelectric stations, and we operate all three of those hydroelectric stations, producing power for tenants in the mill, plus we're tied into the grid, and we sell all excess power uh, back to the grid to Georgia Power. Uh, we prefer to keep it all on site, if possible, because we make more money by uh, keeping it on site as opposed to what Georgia Power will sell. But uh, the canal uh, is the most visited uh, tourism uh, attraction in Augusta, for, aside from the Masters Golf Tournament, which is coming up in <laughs> a week or two. But uh, uh, annually, uh, uh, through the, uh, a magazine called The Best of Augusta, it, it is always rated number one for a whole variety of uh, things. But uh, uh, it, it saved Augusta. And uh, like I say, it's, it's, it's still powering Augusta today in many different ways. And Heather, you can go ahead and advance it. And the, the slides that follow are gonna be how it is. This is the head gates of the canal where the river is uh, in the background. Whoop, back, back up. Uh, the, the river is in the background and the, there's a diversion dam as you can see built across the Savannah River and it backs the water up and, and goes into the canal. And um, the 
uh, there's a set of locks you can see on the right side that you can actually lock out of the river into the canal uh, and uh, uh, only in the first level of the canal. The canal has three levels. And so um, the, the, the canal is still, as I said, providing electric power. The city's drinking water is, comes out of the canal. Uh, it's a, uh, like I say, a, a main tourism attraction for the city uh, for recreation and education and preservation. And our, uh, our uh, mission ranges from preservation, conservation, all the way to economic development. Uh, uh, and uh, we can uh, continue to uh, uh, expand our trail system along the canal. You can see between the the land between the canal and the river there is, is, a, is the start of an extensive uh, trail system that we've developed over the last uh, 25 years uh, uh, along the canal. You can advance it, uh, Heather, next one. But the canal obviously is a very uh, uh, an attractive place to, to paddle a canoe or kayak. Uh, it's a great place to go ahead and uh, show the slide for running. Uh, and I don't know whether uh, other heritage areas, well, I do know, I know I talked to Alan Sachs uh, DNL yesterday, and uh, they saw a great increase in trail usage during the pandemic. And we certainly saw the same thing happening when people were sheltered in at home and they got tired of looking at four walls and there was no better way to, 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 uh, a social distance and get out on the on a trail system and either bike or, or walk or run. Okay. Uh, and we we have uh, we we built two replica Petersburg boats. Uh, right, there you go. Uh, they they were built in a little town up uh, west of Augusta called Petersburg, which is now underneath a reservoir. It doesn't exist anymore. But these these long narrow boats would bring cotton and tobacco down the river, lock into the canal, come into the canal and offload at the mills or put it on wagons and take it over to the Savannah River and have it shipped to Savannah. Uh, we operate these guided tours uh, daily. Uh, they're very popular. Uh, uh, we, uh, like I say, we built uh, two of them. Uh, and uh, part of the story is uh, they're, they're powered with batteries. Uh, the chargers to charge up the batteries are come right off hydroelectric power from the mills that we uh, operate the hydroelectric plant. So it's a complete uh, circle. And as I say, it's uh, they're very popular, particularly with school groups. Uh, and uh, uh, again, the pandemic, uh, we had to cut back on the number of people that we could put on the boat at one time to get social distancing. But we, we've continued to operate them throughout this period uh, with all these restrictions. Okay, Heather, I think that might be the, uh, of course then uh, bike, biking is another popular activity along the, along the canal and the waterway. And uh, uh, a lot of uh, people uh, like to just stroll, uh, go ahead and advance, uh, go to the next one. Uh, stroll uh, along the canal, uh, uh, take a go to the next one. Uh, and very interesting thing, uh, one of the things that uh, annually comes up is the, the favorite thing people like to do is, is, is say it's the best place to walk your dog <laughs> along the, the towpath along the canal. Okay, Heather. So that's a quick overview of, of what we're doing uh, and with the canal system. And uh, like I say, it's uh, uh, been a, a great as we continue to uh, offer a different uh, activities uh, and activities along the canal, uh, the, the activities continue to increase pretty significantly. So I'll stop there and answer questions at the end and move on to the next one. Okay, thank you so much, Dayton. All right, Anna um, Koval from Illinois Michigan Canal National Heritage Area is going to share next. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, and it looks good. Okay, thank you. 
So um, today I'm going to talk about our bike share program. So I'm not going to give you any history or tell you about anything else we're going to do. I'm just going to spend my eight minutes talking about the bike share. So Heather, can I advance this or do you? You should be able to advance it by clicking on the little arrow button on the slide. Okay. No. Let's see. I there should I be like in the bottom left hand corner. You see the arrow? Yeah, I've got everybody in in my way. Nope, I can't. Can you just go ahead? Uh, no, because you're sharing you, you're sharing it. Can you try your mouse advancing it via your mouse? Oh, that's what I did. Let me just see. Okay. I think I just hit the screen. So let's see how this goes. Okay, so we started an INM Canal uh, bike share system. And first, I wanted to just say um, a little bit about why we did that. Um, we did it because we have great trails, including 75 plus miles of towpath along the canal. Uh, the Illinois Michigan Canal was uh, 96 miles long, so it's not all there, but most of it is. And we have great towpath trails. We also have other trails within our National Heritage Area. So we also have a great market with Chicago land so close. So I think we have about 13 million people within 90 minutes of our area. So um, we have a large market to draw from. Um, you know, a lot of visitors or potential visitors, even if they're bike riders, um, they can't bring their bike or don't want to bring their bike or their bikes are too expensive. They don't have a rack. They don't want the bike for the rest of the trip if they're just going to take a little ride. So, um, you know, a lot of people just don't ride our trails because they think about coming and doing other things. So we have been interested in doing this as an organization for a long time, or really we started with the idea of could we incentivize the private market? Why isn't, uh, why aren't people um, offering bike rentals? And so we talked to a lot of places, bike shops, and, and there are a few bike rentals in this uh, 100 mile long region. Um, but not very many. And what we found was they're not very convenient. They're either at the bike shop, it's not very close to the trail, they don't open till 10 o'clock, people wanna ride before then, or the time you have to get it back. It's just a lot of um, logistical problems or um, these bike shops don't wanna do it, it's seasonal, the insurance is too high, they say. So in 2019, we felt like we had um, finally figured it out. Um, we um, contracted with a system um, uh, with a vendor. I got 25 bikes, five stations, uh, charged an hourly fee. You rent the bike on your cell phone and we marketed it towards visitors. So um, our partners in this program, the, the reason we were ending that we ended up doing this is we found the money. So um, here you see 10 women from the Lockport Women's Club and they actually sponsored this location. So we asked for local sponsors to our location. Uh, meanwhile, the um, State of Illinois Office of Tourism um, gave us a grant for 50% of the first two years of operation through this vendor. Yeah, to support the system. So uh, we called out to our communities. Two of our communities said, fine, who do we write the check to? Um, it was a $10,000 um, entry fee. Um, a lot of our communities said, oh, we're too poor. Oh, we've already budgeted our money. Oh, we don't know about this. So uh, we turned as we always do to other people to find the money. And in this case in Lockport, um, the head of the president of the women's club just happened to be having lunch at our visitor center. And I said, hey, we'd like to have a location here. Do you know anyone? And she said, I think we'll do it. So, um, and we found other private money to help uh, start the system. So it's, uh, it was a mixture of funds um, that let us start. And of course, our other partners would be the landowners. So um, all of the 
uh, five locations are near the trail, um, but uh, usually on municipal uh, property, not on like DNR or whoever owns the trail. So um, Heather, I'm going by what Heather asked me to talk about. So what were the challenges of our system? Well, to start with, um, I could only find one vendor that would bid on this. And of course, the state grant required multiple vendors. And um, everybody I called and said, ah, eh, your system's too small, 25 bikes, we don't want to deal with it, we can't provide the maintenance, that kind of thing. So I got the state to agree that since I had reached out to enough people, they would go with one vendor. So, but um, we had timing as a challenge. The state had just offered these grants after five years of not. We had a new governor, he wanted to show um, progress. And so we had a very short window to get everything up and running. Meanwhile, our bike vendor was not so excited about this short window. And since they had not worked in our area, they didn't know who to contract. Uh, to put the bikes together, to put the stations together. And of course, you know, I was like, come on, come on, come on, we got to go here. Uh, I promised the state. So uh, you see um, my husband's son and grandson here putting together our bike stations. I got the bike company to give a contract to them to put together the bike stations. I said, it can't be that hard. They have all the tools and everything, let's go. So um, we finally got the stations together. And um, another one of our challenges was because of the timing we launched really mid season and um, so we didn't have a whole season together to really evaluate. So changes to the system. So that was 2019, we got started. And uh, I'll tell you about um, some of the things that happened through 2019. So meanwhile, COVID hit in 2020 and our bike vendor said, eh, we don't, we don't wanna take the bikes out yet. And we're like, the weather's beautiful. Everyone's on the trail. What are you talking about? And they kept putting us off. And finally they said, you know, we're probably going out of business, so we're not gonna do anything. So it's a very long story. Um, and it's much longer than the eight minutes that Heather has given me here. And if you'd like to hear the story, I'm happy to tell it, but it probably would include some wine because it's still not over. But while it was not our choice, what we ended up doing was securing um, ownership of the bikes and stations ourselves. And uh, so the, um, the Canal Quarter Association owns the bikes and stations. We contracted with a software company, we found insurance and maintenance people and decided to run the system ourselves. So it's less expensive, but it's gonna be more work. So we're just launching the system now in 2021. We're doing the marketing, we've always been doing the marketing. So here's one of our signs that tells you how uh, to download the app and use your cell phone and um, rent a bike. So surprises along the way. Um, so some of the demographics of 2019 um, was a surprise to me. Um, over half of our riders were between 18 and 35. Uh, so we attracted a much younger audience and two thirds of them were women. So this is not a demographic that we um, have very, um, very much of uh, in our um, historical program. So it was great to see a younger demographic out here coming to visit our area. So um, the average ride in 2019 was just over an hour. So people just took a little spin and you know, then went on and did all the other things that there are to do. Um, in our area. So, so the lessons we learned is that, um, you know, along with everybody else, COVID actually made the desire to get out and be on our trails and to ride bikes and do things like this um, a lot more uh, desirous. Um, a lot of our rural activities are going up. I've been told that rural is going to be hot for at least five years. Um, so we are 
um, you know, we are optimistic about the system and what we can do with it. Um, another thing that we learned, though, is that a system like this is dependent on cell service. And so, so in some of our uh, rural communities, um, like one cell provider will not be as good as some of others. So you kind of have to figure out what the cell service is for the exact location where they're locking and unlocking the bike. So um, that's kind of a consideration here. So as far as outcomes of the system, um, I would say it's too early to tell. Um, but certainly um, us running the system ourselves, I think we're much closer to sustainability of running um, a system that will actually pay for itself. Um, we're just getting the bikes out this season and um, we're finding that there's a lot of ridership already. We don't officially launch until April 1st. So since we have a new software company, we've been out uh, trying the bikes and um, Anyway, so we plan to evaluate where we are towards the end of the summer and then really propose how to go forward um, and see if we can um, manage the system, you know, how much the fees will, um, will um, support the system, how much we need from sponsors, advertisers. Um, we are looking at how to expand the system already. We have many communities now that they're out there and they see people riding um, that want to join too. So we also are looking at expanding the system. Um, anybody who's looked for a bike lately will know there are none to be had um, at any bike shop. So um, we, are, we are sourcing um, bikes and uh, trying to figure out I would say by this time next year, as long as the money looks good, um, we'll probably have 50 bikes out there. So that's my presentation and I'd be happy to answer any questions at the end. Thank you, Anna. All right, it is now um, time to hear from Schuylkill River Greenway National Heritage Area and Elaine Schaefer and Tim Finchel are going to share um, about their project. And Anna, you need to unshare your... <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's see. Okay, Erin, help me over here. There you go. Oops. Okay. Hold on. All right. Good. Yes. All right. Now we're going to okay. share. All right. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I am Elaine Schaefer with Schuylkill River Greenways and Tim Fenchel and I are going to tell you a little bit about our recreational programming. I'm going to start out and talk a little bit about our traditional programming and what we ha what we have been doing for many years. And I'm going to take you up to the pandemic and then the pandemic, Tim is going to take it from there because we have had like enormous changes from the pandemic that are actually pretty exciting. Um, so a little bit about us, um, we are outside of Philadelphia in Pennsylvania, five counties wide, and we are all about the Schuylkill River. Um, this is a fancy mission statement of ours, but really all it means is um, our, our mission is to connect people and communities to the Schuylkill River. Um, and the Schuylkill River is of great import to our region because of its role in um, our history and our culture, starting from the Revolutionary War to the Industrial Revolution to the Environmental Revolution. Um, and it's really been the backbone of our region in all of those eras. And it still today provides the drinking water for over 2 million people. Um, so how do we do that? How do we connect people and uh, communities to the river? We do it through um, a lot of recreational programming <laughs> and, um, and education. Now, to, we, we, we do it, th the, the main project that we do it with is the Schuylkill River Trail. And that is a trail that starts in Philadelphia and when finished will be 120 miles, about 75 miles are built now. Um, and we actually build and maintain and own many miles of this trail. Um, so that is one aspect of what we do is build it, but we also do a lot of programming on the trail, which we will talk about in a moment. 
Um, the second way we connect people to the river is actually on the river. And we do a lot of programming, kayaking programming, programming, educational programming on the river. And we're very, very famous for a, a seven day sojourn that we've been running for 22 years. Um, and it happens in June every year. And we get about 200 people a, a year to participate from all over the United States and the world. And it's a seven day trip, camping, the whole thing. Now, um, some of the ways traditionally that we have connected people to the river, the, the typical programming that we've been running for years and years and years, number one, a bike share, um, not too different from the one you just heard about, um, but uh, I'll tell you some more details about it in a moment. Um, but we've been doing our bike share for 12 years. So uh, it has definitely morphed over the years and again, morphed during the pandemic. Um, we run kayaking program um, and pedal and paddles. Pedal and paddles is uh, when we bring a group in and we give them a guided bike ride and then they ditch their bikes and get in kayaks and, and, and kayak back down to where they started. That's a really popular program that we've been running for years and years. And then we do big bike rides where we uh, you know, have 400 people come and do a big ride and do a fundraiser, uh, things like that. Our bike share. It is a little bit different than the one you just heard about because we it's not um, self-serve. We do it through people. Um, so it's only available the, the hours that we can man it. It's totally free. It's pretty, at this point, it's pretty um, old school and low key. Uh, the user comes in, they sign a waiver and then they give us their license um, so that we know they come back and then they take the bike out. It's not, it's, it's pretty uncomplicated at this point. Um, but over time, it has morphed to that. You know, we used to have a website and, and sign-ins and, and all kinds of um, um, other aspects of it. Um, we have, we operated out of our office or to just traditionally have operated out of our main office, but we also have partners who we give the bikes to and they will keep them and also lend bikes out from their locations. And those are in parks mostly. Um, we have a little park in Pottstown and a little park in a neighboring town and their park personnel kind of take, adopts it and, and lends out the bikes. Um, it's been funded through grants very generously for a long time, a health and wellness foundation that's local here, as well as one of our bigger foundations, the William Penn Foundation. Um, and some of our, uh, some state money. Um, some of the things that we've had, uh, we really had challenges with, we, you know, it costs a lot of money, the, the insurance costs a lot of money. We, we actually insure the bike program separately than our regular liability insurance for all of our other programming, which, um, you know, cause the bike share is, is just, I, I guess our insurers feel it's an added level, level of exposure. Um, and I think because of that added exposure, it is hard to find partners who are willing to be our, to be, you know, satellite locations that, um, and I, right now the only ones we have are sort of governmentally um, affiliated. So they don't have so much of the insurance issue. Um, it's also has been a challenge to find, um, you know, to find someone to take the contract on to do the maintenance of the bikes and do the, the weekly checks uh, and the repair that's, that's required. Um, you know, bike shops really tend to come and go. <laughs> uh, and um, so that's been a challenge over time. Now it's really another challenge is, is actually finding the bikes because as um, Anna mentioned, it's, you know, we, we actually now have a second grant to do replace 16 of the bikes. Um, we have about 30 to 40 and we can't, we can't find the bikes. So like, I think we put it in all, an order and it's not coming, we're not getting these bikes for like six months. So that's been frustrating. It's a good thing, but it's also frustrating. Um, as I said, I described the pedal and paddles that we did, that we do, that's a picture of, uh, you know, a group going out on a bike ride together. Um, we have our organized bike rides and our sojourns to get people out on um, the river. And all of that was, all of those things that we do over the years depended heavily upon having, having an outfitter to support us. You know, an outfitter who would 
um, provide the kayaks, provide the on water guiding, you know, had all the certifications, would provide um, the support and maintenance of the bike program and bike guided bike tours. Um, because that's not something our staff is qualified to do. So, and we had a really good relationship for a particular outfitter for many years, um, and it worked out pretty well. I mean, some outfitters came and go. This typically uh, on the Schuylkill River is not, a, uh, there is not a recreational industry that is burgeoning, uh, and it has been a goal of ours for over the last four or five years to really grow and help um, kickstart that industry because there's no reason why it shouldn't be. You know, it's a beautiful river and it has all the things that the Lehigh and the Susquehanna and all the other rivers have. Um, but just for whatever reason, it, it, um, we haven't seen that recreational industry. Now I'm gonna kick it over to Tim, who's gonna tell you about what happened last spring. So uh, last spring, uh, March, the COVID-19 pandemic hits and everybody goes into quarantine and our outfitter that we have been using for over a decade calls us and says, I think I'm done. I don't think I'm going to make it through this. Uh, I'm closing my doors, which left us um, not only wondering what we were going to do in the pandemic, whether we'd be able to offer programming at all, but even beyond that, um, you know, we relied on, on that outfitter a lot for all of our programming that Elaine just mentioned. So we were really stuck with no other option but to pursue some pretty creative ways uh, of how we would have outfitting in the future. And we had heard a year or so prior about a model, a business model in the Pinelands of New Jersey where a 501c3 nonprofit um, started an outfitter as a limited liability corporation um, operating as two separate businesses, but with one board of directors. And so we did our due diligence. We met with those folks. We worked with our board of directors, um, put together a business plan. And in the midst of the pandemic, we purchased an outfitter uh, using that model. And uh, we now have a outfitter called Take It Outdoors. And it is that same model. It is a limited liability corporation with the sole member of the board of directors of the Schuylkill River Greenways. So the, the role of Take It Outdoors has to be connected to our mission. And so the mission that Elaine shared ultimately is the same mission of Take It Outdoors, this outfitter. Um, and we officially launched in um, early June of last year. So from, I would say the first part of April, April and May in the span of about eight weeks, uh, we worked through this partnership and, uh, and launched it in June. Um, <clears throat> so Take It Outdoors is a strategic partnership of ours. It's sort of like a sister organization. Um, it is consistent with our mission. It is consistent with our programming. Uh, the, they now manage the bike share that Elaine was talking about as previously we had partnered with multiple different bike shops uh, and some have stayed in business, some have gone out of business. Um, the director, we have a, a full-time director who runs the entire uh, Take It Outdoors Outfitter. Uh, that uh, that uh, person is a, a bike mechanic, so they can manage our bike share program. We still have partners that when the pandemic sort of hopefully lifts at some point here, we will reopen some of our, our remote locations, but uh, the bike share now is housed directly through uh, Take It Outdoors. And one of the great things that we've been able to figure out through the first year uh, of uh, Take It Outdoors is we've been able to figure out ways to reach um, new and broader audiences. <clears throat> So as has been mentioned before, I think Dayton mentioned it, you know, I think all of us probably in heritage areas uh, who are connected to trails and, and recreation programs saw the explosion in recreation in 2020 with people really turning to the outdoors uh, for uh, wellness um, of all kinds. And so that was no different in our region. There were sections and pieces of the Schuylkill River Trail that saw almost a 200% increase in trail use. Um, so even though we were pretty hesitant about this launching this business uh, in the midst of, of the pandemic, it probably was a blessing in disguise um, 
people really, really were looking for ways to get outside and bike and kayak and hike. And so from July to October, our very first four or five months um, running the business, we had over 1,200 participants in different programs, um, which was pretty amazing. We were very pleased with that. Uh, we were able to reach into new and diverse communities up and down the river. We had a huge increase in program delivery. Uh, one of the really neat things that we're able to do through um, Take It Outdoors is they are able to work with some of our other nonprofit partners in the region who also do programming somewhat similar to ours. Um, and they can now use Take It Outdoors for their bike programs, for their youth education programs, for their water-based programs. Um, so there really is a lot of potential here for this partnership, uh, we think in the coming years. And that is also a potential revenue stream for the Schuylkill River Greenway. So when heritage areas are, are thinking of constantly being challenged with ways to uh, find sustainable resources um, for their organization, um, this was one of the real benefits uh, for us taking on this challenge um, and this project. So, uh, you know, it, it's difficult. There are, there are some challenges in addition to that, any kind of seasonal um, business <clears throat> provides challenges, but we're working at coming up with some, uh, some winter programs, uh, whether it's workshops or trainings or potentially even some winter like hiking trips that people might be interested in doing. We've expanded into doing like uh, kayaking and birding programs. Uh, we are potentially looking at a kayaking program this coming year um, that's with a group that's somewhat similar to the Wounded Warriors, uh, to vets who are looking for uh, ways to recreate and based on uh, their, their disabilities, um, they're, they're getting people in the kayaks, uh, which is a really interesting way of doing that. So we're working with one of the local groups to potentially pursue that kind of um, avenue. So um, what was a pretty uh, nerve wracking and uh, very strenuous spring for us last year, uh, here we are getting ready to start our second season um, with Take It Outdoors uh, and the new recreational outfitter along the school pool. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Um, all right, our next and final speaker is Mark Platts from Susquehanna National Heritage Area. Don't forget to unmute. <laughs> okay, unmuted. Gonna share my screen. Okay. Okay, everybody seen that? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm gonna talk about uh, our River Discovery uh, boat tour program uh, that we started uh, two years ago. Uh, on the Susquehanna River. Uh, our heritage area is York and Lancaster counties of Pennsylvania with the Susquehanna at the center of those two counties, uh, just north of Maryland. Uh, so we're the last part of Pennsylvania where the river flows through before going to Maryland and Chesapeake Bay. Our headquarters and our boat tours are operated on this body of water you see in the picture, uh, which is Lake Clark, uh, which is actually a 12 to 13 mile long reservoir that's behind a hydroelectric dam, uh, one of four that are on the last 50 miles of the uh, Susquehanna River before the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, so the, the dams create, uh, have, have eliminated the original bed of the river, which would have been great for kayaking, but the uh, reservoirs uh, provide some interesting boating opportunities. And this particular area is the most uh, popular power boating and sailboating and um, area of the Susquehanna and Pennsylvania. So we, uh, we've been fortunate to be on the Susquehanna River for 17 years, I guess, since we uh, originally rented part of this historic home uh, now known as the Zimmerman Center for Heritage. Uh, we rented part of it from the folks that had renovated it and three years in, in 2007, they gave us the building and the property. Um, that led us to get much more into direct uh, sort of the retail side of tourism and heritage areas uh, with Turk transforming it into a visitor center. Uh, in 2015, uh, I think it's 15, we completed, 14, 15, we completed a million and a half dollars of renovations outside. So you all can see my cursor, right? Yeah. Oh. Okay. So we rebuilt the whole parking area. Uh, 
created a stormwater drainage system, added walkways and ADA pathway all the way to the riverfront from the building, from the rear of the building, uh, included a stormwater system that leads to a rain garden wetland, so all the water goes into an environmentally appropriate place. We built a waterfront pavilion, a boardwalk and kayak launch, and a boat dock. Um, and the original idea of the boat dock was that we could welcome boaters uh, to our site uh, who boat on the river on a seasonal basis. Uh, we never got many boaters visiting the site, you know, tying up and coming to visit a few. Uh, but as we uh, improved the property and increased visitation, we also attracted new partnerships even before we were a National Heritage Area uh, with the National Park Service through the Captain John Smith Chesapeake National Historic Trail, uh, which is a, a water-based trail uh, that runs from the headwaters of the Susquehanna in Cooperstown, New York, all the way down the Susquehanna, all through the bay, up the Potomac, up the James, up the Chester, the very big water trail system. Um, and when we did our improvements, it attracted the Park Service to say, hey, we'd, we'd like your building to be a visitor contact station for the trail. And so since 2016, I guess, uh, 17, 15, 16, we've had a cooperative agreement with the Park Service for that. And, uh, in, and now we have, of course, the National Heritage Area too. Uh, but that led us to develop uh, ideas for programs. We started doing a lot more field trips uh, for kids at the site. And we started talking about boat tours uh, because in our part of the river, if you don't own a boat or you don't paddle, there's no, there's no other way to get on the water. There's nobody providing boat tours. There's no uh, private programs that are doing that in our area. You have to go farther north or south for that. So we decided to launch uh, what we call river discovery boat tours or river discovery tours. Um, and we went through about two years of process, including a feasibility study. You know, everybody wants a feasibility study uh, to make sure it makes sense. Uh, we hired a, a great consultant out of Pittsburgh, the Hill Group, who had uh, worked with Rivers of Steel um, on, on their boat, uh, their big boat uh, tours they have out there. Um, and uh, they did a study that, that really looked at how we could do this in our part of the river. Uh, provided a, couple, a number of different options uh, from owning our own boat and operating it to contracting for services. And we also, they also helped us work through Coast Guard uh, requirements because even though we're not a tidal water, we're not on the Bay of the Atlantic, the Susquehanna River remains classified as a navigable river of the United States, even though it's not navigable. <laughs> there are four hydro dams and shallow waters and everything, but it falls under Coast Guard jurisdiction. And that's particularly important for uh, those that operate boats for passenger vessels for hire. It means if you're gonna if you're gonna have a boat tour and you're gonna charge people, your boat has to meet Coast Guard requirements and your captain has to be a master captain of a certain qualification. So, um, so somebody's not muted there, I don't think. <laughs> so uh, and uh, so, but we also went through a process to the Coast Guard to say, well, what if the tours are free? And we got an effect, we had to go through an admiral at the Coast Guard and, and a Coast Guard inspection office and finally got a determination that if we don't take any kind of consideration for the tours, uh, we don't charge, we don't take tips, we don't take donations, uh, we can do free tours and the boat and, and it's not under Coast Guard jurisdiction then. It's not a passenger vessel for hire. We still have to meet Pennsylvania regulations and, and things like that and, and normal safety, but we could do it. So we chose to start that way uh, with a pilot program. We had a local marina who we talked to and, and the only sort of full service marina in our area. And they had just changed ownership and the new owners were expanding for to appeal more to tourists and visitors, started their own boat rental program for pontoon boats. And we ended up deciding the best option to start was to contract with the marina for the boat and the operator. Uh, they bring the boat here to our dock we provide the step on guides. So we employ uh, the seasonal guides on the boat uh, who, then, who then lead the tour uh, on the boat. Uh, we, uh, let's see, I jump to the next one there. So we conducted tours from our own dock uh, right in front of the Zimmerman Center. Um, we started out with a uh, just Saturday and Sunday program of three tours a day. We've, in the second season, which was, we started out in 2019, our second season was 2020. Uh, we expanded to Friday, Saturday, Sunday, four tours a day. Uh, you know, it's a pontoon boat, a 26 footer, it's limited in space. So it's, we really can only carry 12 passengers uh, comfortably uh, with the operator and guide. 
Uh, we also were able to secure grants from the National Park Service Chesapeake Bay Office um, and the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation Natural Resources State Heritage Area Program uh, that gave us enough funding to cover at least two pilot seasons. And it, it actually, with COVID delays and other delays, uh, we think it's going to cover most of what we need for this coming season. Uh, so we, we, in the first two seasons, we offered 268 tours, um, carried just over 2,000 passengers. Again, it was 12 per tour, but when COVID hit, we delayed the start of the 2020 season uh, from Memorial Day to, to July 4th, and we reduced capacity on the boats to eight, um, requiring masks. Uh, interestingly, we had a master captain, even though we weren't required to, who operated the boat our first season for the local marina. Uh, but when we told him he was gonna have to wear a mask or a shield or whatever, he refused to do that. And so he's no longer our captain. <laughs> so uh, the marina had to get other captains for that. Uh, but we had a very successful season last year, even with COVID because people were, you know, it's outside, people are wanting to get outside. At eight passengers, it wasn't overly crowded. Um, and we, we ran the tours uh, for, for the average over both seasons, 84% of capacity. Um, the reason it's not 100% is when you have free tours, people will book tours and then not show up. Um, and so suddenly you have some empty seats. Um, we were able to fill some of those with sort of standby folks. Um, we're thinking of see if we can have a, we can't charge for the tour, but we maybe can have a cancellation charge. So that if you don't show up, <laughs> you're charged. Uh, so we're going to look into that. Um, but, it, you know, they ran, they were very popular. I mean, as soon as we posted the, the, the tours on their website, our, our system actually crashed one the first time we did this because there was just too many people trying to get the tickets. Um, and then some people figured out how to game the system a little bit and get more than four people on their tour and all that kind of stuff. But overall, it went pretty well. Um, we used Eventbrite for free tickets and, and it seemed to, to go okay. Um, Interested in 2020, uh, of the people on the boat tours, uh, for 78% of them, it was their first visit to the Zimmerman Center. So it's it's also a way to, you know, it, it's an attractor that brings people and they go, oh, what do you got here? You know, and suddenly we can share what's inside the building, Native Lands County Parks behind us, and they can learn about that. And so it's just generally increased activity and, and uh, interest. Um, the seasonal cost, it, we haven't had a total full season yet because of COVID and the first season got started a little late, but it's generally about $30,000 a season to contract for the boat and the operator. Uh, they're handling the insurance, you know, they're, we're contracting with them. Um, and we pay uh, for, for the guides, it costs us about 5,000 for a season uh, for part-time guides. Um, we found out though, with the popularity that we need a bigger boat, you know, as you, um, it wasn't about sharks, it was about, demand. Um, we just saw so much interest in this. Uh, even when we had our National Heritage Celebration two years ago, we brought the local congressmen and officials and everything to the event on the pontoon boat just before we launched the public tours. Well, the whole National Heritage newspaper articles was always the boat. It's a picture of the boat. <laughs> Everybody loves the boat. Um, so we decided we, we, we should look into a bigger boat. Um, we started out looking at a bigger pontoon boat. Uh, working with the marina to spec out a sightseer and cruise boat that they make down in Florida. It's a $125,000 boat with trailer and everything meets all U.S. Coast Guard requirements, can carry 20-some people. Um, but then in the middle of that, um, this boat came to our attention. So a local outfitter who we work with down the river had an association with Lake Ostego up in New York and, and the owner of this boat. Um, and we learned it was for sale. Um, and that had previously done tours on Lake Otsego, Otsego Lake in New York at Cooperstown. Uh, that's also the headwaters of the Susquehanna. Uh, that's where the river begins. Um, and the boat was electric. Uh, and it was electric when it was built in 1912, uh, made by a company called the Electric Launch Company. Before the gasoline motors took over boats like they did cars, um, electric boats were all the rage for about 20 years. Um, and the boat was eventually repowered with gas, but a little over 10 years ago, the current owner uh, put electric engines back in it and battery power. So we had a green boat that's also historic and it also spent its entire life on the waters of the Susquehanna where it begins. So we thought that's pretty cool. Uh, could we get this boat? 
And we've spent a year um, uh, on this boat and we now have a sales agreement uh, for it. We are going through the next steps. Um, and one, one key interest of this boat we think will attract attention is it was built in 1912 for Adolphus Bush, the founder of the Anheuser-Busch Company and was used at the Bush estate on Ostega Lake. And we're buying the boat from the great, great grandson of Adolphus Bush. So we got a great beer boat uh, uh, for, for future beer charters and, and, and uh, trips. That's actually the, the Bush family on the, on the boat when it was brand new. Um, and we think that has an interesting extra element of attraction uh, for the boat. Uh, we have gone through a lot of due diligence, everything from figuring out how to transport it, insure it, to capacities, Coast Guard inspection. We have a Marine surveyor engaged to help us through the Coast Guard stuff. But the key was, we got to ride this boat and we got to see if it feels right. And with COVID, uh, of course that got delayed, uh, but we finally took a nice cruise on the boat last September. Uh, and we came away with the phrase pleasant and relaxing, uh, which was especially nice during COVID. Um, and it really was a joy to travel on this boat. It's quiet, it travels uh, eight to nine miles an hour. It's a fairly decent cruise speed. Um, and it's just wonderful. And it's got a wonderful character uh, people are going to love it. Uh, we figured out that it can meet Coast Guard passenger requirements with, uh, for fee-based tours. Uh, we have an assessment of that. We still have to go through that process uh, with some improvements, uh, not, hopefully nothing major, except redoing the electrical system. That's about it. Uh, we figured it, uh, it can carry 20 to 24 passengers at least. Uh, 24 is probably the most it's comfortable with seating. But if we carry average of 22 at 75% capacity, that would mean we'd be carrying over 6,000 passengers a year, expanding to a five day a week uh, schedule. Uh, the battery power means that we're, we estimate eight less, uh, saving $8,000 in gasoline for the power engines uh, and only paying about $500 in electricity. Um, and we think we can charge a premium ticket price that will allow us to net maybe 10,000 more a year than we could from the pontoon boat. Now, I'm not going to go into all the maintenance and other costs. We have a whole budget for that. And, 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 and you know, this is a lot more responsibility than a pontoon boat. Uh, but we, uh, we think it's one that we can take on. We're currently working through due diligence, uh, going to get Coast Guard reviews and plans. Uh, we expect to close on the boat in June, uh, transport it here in July, uh, and start uh, final Coast Guard inspections, launch tours, we hope, for our 20th anniversary weekend in August as a, as a Pennsylvania heritage area. If COVID and everybody's vaccinated, we'll, we'll be in good shape. Um, some, some quick lessons learned, there's a lot more than this, but uh, people really like boat rides and if they're free, they really, really like them. Um, take the US, Co if, you, if you're in an area subject to Coast Guard, take it seriously and go through the process. I mean, we, we first started out like, well, do we have to do that? And can we fight that? And No, just, just do it. Um, and, and you'll be better off. Uh, make sure your board is behind the project. Uh, the board was generally supportive through the pontoon boat uh, phase uh, when we started looking at the wooden boat and the big boat. Uh, it took a number of special board meetings and some reconsiderations of things as the price changed and uh, getting people on board. You know, I, I did more lobbying with the board on this boat than I've done on anything in 18 years of working with the Heritage Area for, for with board members. I, I made individual calls and, and tried to address all their questions up front. So we had near unanimous support for it. Hey Mark, we're almost out of time. So if you okay. could like. We're, we're, we just got a new shuttle van. We hope to combine that with the boat tours um, and we're done. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, so this went much longer than I thought it would, which is fine. It's been fantastic. I've loved everybody's presentations. So, um, and I can stick around, but if people do have to sign off, that's perfectly fine. So I don't mind keeping the call going a little over time today. But if you have questions, you should type them in the chat now or unmute yourself. And Mark, if you could unshare your um, yeah, I'm working on that <laughs> presentation, that would be great. Why can't if you I have a question? Um, unmute yourself and ask it of any of the four presenters. Uh, 
Well, if nobody else had a question. I have got like five, but we'll just start with one. Um, okay. I'm, say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to Liz for her parents not getting tickets. Um. So, uh. So, Anna, I have a question. When you had uh, the bikes and you were, you said you you put them on municipal property. Did you have to have like a, a like a, a agreement, like a signed agreement with them saying that? It's okay to have it there, like a land use agreement or something to put the bikes on the municipal property? So everybody was um, slightly different. We asked them to come up with whatever agreement they needed to have. So the onus was on them to you know, come up with what they needed. Uh, we did provide everybody with a certificate of insurance. So some communities got it together. A couple of our communities said, uh, go for it, put the bikes up, we'll work on the agreement. But we do have an agreement with everybody. Okay, thank you. Other questions? I have a question for Anna um, about the, were you, were you strategic about the placement of the different stations or is it just about what partners wanted to step forward and provide that space? Um, we, our, our trails aren't as, as long. We don't have as, you know, much trails as y'all do, but, you know, I would like to put them in strategic places. I'm just curious about the thought process. On so decisions. we always, we always start any of these things with kind of the strategic, where would we really like them and what would make sense and what's the best thing for visitors and, you know, where, where we think they're going to be most successful. Um, we'll have the most ridership, that kind of thing. Um, but you know, when it comes down to money, there are some people that will step forward. And so we tried to encourage the places that we wanted. Um, but some of those places just couldn't get it together and we couldn't come up. We worked with everybody in terms of, you know, is there private funding if you can't do it? And so, um, we worked with everybody, but at the end, at the end of the day, if you could write the check, we put bikes there too. So. Okay, um, well, we have a question in the chat and Elaine, I'm gonna start with you, but Anna could also chime in on this, but we'll start with you and um, Tim first. It says for bike share programs, are they marketed for recreation and or tourism? So her basic, I think the point is for local residents and or visitors, like when you, when you have them, like what demographic are you targeting? So, I mean, interestingly in the beginning, we, at the very beginning, 12 years ago, it was designed as both recreation, but also alternate transportation in Pottstown, which is a, a pretty um, economically challenged city and, and many people don't have cars. Um, so, you know, it had a, sort of a dual role. I'd say now 12 years in that, that um, that aspect of it is really less emphasized and it's really about recreation and bringing people to the area. In fact, we placed an ad in our um, DMO, um, you know, the book that goes in every hotel room um, that has Take It Outdoors and the bike share in it. So yes, it is definitely, we're, we're marketing it to get people to the river from tourists, in, from tourists and, and residential people. Okay, Anna? Um, so we did market it just to tourists. Um, we had the option of creating an annual subscription, which a lot of communities do if it's marketed towards local residents, you know, $50 a year or something like that. And you can get on and off, you know, within an hour. Or so when people use it for local transportation, but again, since our funders were interested in bringing more visitors to the area and the economic development that they bring, we didn't offer an annual subscription. We just offered a, a um, uh, an hourly rate. So obviously local people could use it. Um, and I think that's a good idea. I think a lot of people rode the trail, even though they've lived there, for, you know, all their lives, they rode the trail for the first time, they checked it out, that kind of thing. And uh, that I think is a good thing because then, then they can refer uh, visitors to that amenity. Um, but we really designed it for visitors. Okay. 
Um, I'll give. If I could just share on the boat tours, um, you know, we thought this would be great to appeal to visitors, but because they were free and because of the way they booked up, um, most of our vis most of our riders were from the region, with some visitors finding their way uh, to get tickets. One of the reasons we wanted to get a bigger boat and have a fee structure is that it could, you know, sort of. Uh, provide bigger capacity, but also limit a little bit, and we'd be able to market it to visitors more. So, right. Okay. Well, we are out of time. So, if there are any questions, I would say send a message like right now. Otherwise, we're going to close down the call. But I would like to take this opportunity while we're raised, if you have any other questions, to thank all of our presenters. The presentations were great, and I was really sucked in, and all of a sudden looked at the clock and was like, oh, we're almost out of time. So it was, it was really enjoyable today. Everybody did fantastic. I loved, I loved all the different presentations. Um, so thank you so much. Are there any other questions?